Good afternoon. Thank you folks for joining us. Oh, welcome. And we have the honor of having with us today three really wonderful people. I'm going to start with Rebecca Ratliff from Atlanta. Rebecca is a very experienced uh, insurance executive claims and an experienced mediator and arbitrator. Uh, Rebecca is in fact a real person, not an attorney like Bill and Sandra and me. <laughs> so she actually still speaks quite perfect English. So if we need interpretation, she'll be there for us. She has our back. Um, uh, Bill Harrison, one of our lead criminal defense attorneys. Oh, by the way, there was a previous, I guess back in January episode or two in which inadvertently the letters ESQ, um, which somebody thinks designates lawyer were put after Rebecca's name. Um, as I say, that was inadvertent. It was erroneous. We apologize. I take responsibility for that mistake. It's my show. So, you know, if you got a problem, let me know. I'm happy to clear it up with you, but hey, we are who we are. Hey, Bill Harrison, one of our leading criminal defense attorneys and civil rights and uh, just a wonderful, wonderful guy whose greatest value in life is actually his wife, Rayatea, who is one of the most fabulous singers with the most beautiful voice for Hawaiian music that you will find in these islands. And so <laughs> I don't apologize to Azure because she's in Oakland. <laughs> Slight apologies to Star, but you know, live with it, Star. So, <laughs> and Sandra Sims, a retired judge. <laughs> we all know who we mean, right? Us and musicians, it's family. So, you know, <laughs> Sandra Sims, retired judge, district and circuit courts. Um, <clears throat> Rebecca it can make whole sentences, being a non-lawyer. <clears throat> Sandra has actually pronounced them. <clears throat> and Bill has had clients on whom sentences have been pronounced. Hopefully not by that. <laughs> so yes. <laughs> I, I have experienced none of the above. I have a BA and an MA in English. And whether I can actually make a literate sentence or not remains out for jury deliberation. Uh, jury's still out on that one. So we will see today whether that can be done or not. Okay, folks. So for today, just picking a topic out of the hat, a statistic that someone gave me is that in 2020, Republicans, state legislators, legislatures, they proposed 40 bills to restrict voting rights. It obviously didn't work, but they haven't given up. This year, in less than two months, they have proposed more than 250 bills to restrict voting rights. So my question to you folks is, what's the point? <laughs> well, I no think one. that, uh, go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead, Stan. No, I'll let you go first. Go Ladies ahead. first. I think they don't want people to vote, in particular people. Yeah, well, <laughs> given what happened in 2020, we can understand that. It's, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It just goes along the lines of redistricting and uh, other uh, ways in which people have tried to quell, um, you know, the, the, the speech and, and the activity of people. Uh, what better way than to take away their voting rights, which is uh, the yeah. basis of our de democracy and our constitution, right? So it's not surprising, though, um, if um, there, people storm the, the, the Capitol, they can, they can try to take away voting rights. See, Bill's got his ESQ. Don't put one after my name. <laughs> <laughs> Don't put one after mine. <laughs> yeah, really. Re Rebecca and I are exempt, right? So yeah. I, I will, there, there is one category of those bills that, I personally find particularly offensive. And that is that my folks are from a small town in Northern Louisiana. I have cousins, I have very, very close friends in the South, including Rebecca. And one of the customs in many places in the South is what's called souls for the poles. And the churches encourage people to exercise their citizen and constitutional right to vote. Good thing. One of the categories of bills that are proposed is to prohibit voting on Sunday. 
to eliminate exactly that souls for the polls sector of votes. Now that I find particularly offensive. It's clearly that notion of churches supporting voting rights and encouraging vote is not limited to the South. Um, many churches have traditions where they actually do voter registration. Um, so to kind of single out and with the idea of being, particularly in the black church, with the idea of being, this is something that you know is definitely encouraged. So going in that is, is particularly is particularly offensive. I mean, it sort of smacks of some of the things that we were looking at in um, Reconstruction times. To be honest, it feels that offensive to me because it goes back that far. Exactly, uh, I totally agree with uh, Sandra, and I also agree with you, Chuck. Um, you know, churches are a lot of times the center, uh, focal point of, of family life for many, many families. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a town square, so to speak, uh, for, uh -huh. for folks in, in towns. And so they get a lot of their information, they learn things in the church setting. Um, to eliminate that from uh, individuals uh, really, really uh, smacks at basically not only um, it has some racial and ethnic overtones, uh, but obviously it has that whole idea of um, uh, of the different classes of people and, and how to how to drive a wedge between people and, and how to silence people. Um, I, yeah, I think it's a it's a a, a terribly uh, radical idea, um, especially if it's coming from the conservatives. Okay, so, radical, well, divisive. Yeah, I mean, and here in Georgia, apparently Georgia legislators are uh, trying to eliminate weekend voting and. Um, there, yes, here in Georgia. Uh, imagine that uh, after Georgia, <laughs> two blue senators, uh, yeah, to even things out. But um, you know, it, it's it's very disturbing because uh, it's so obvious who the target is. Um, you know, the complaints to try to overturn the election. Um, you know, it, it, so many um, people who would know spoke up and said it was the safest election it was the it was the most fair yeah. election ever in yeah. american history. yeah yeah, yeah. the and most three fair. checks three recounts two on the votes and one more on the signatures and it just it's carved in stone so interestingly just in contrast to suggest that bill's observation and sandra's is spot on the mark in all of the midwestern states in which many, many of the evangelical rural ministers have pushed people to actually vote for a particular candidate. We won't say who that was. It might be somebody with an orange complexion, but we won't mention any names here. So look at the difference, right? You don't see any of those bills in North or South Dakota, Nebraska, you know, Iowa, any of those places. You only see them in places in the South. So I have one question for you folks, which was posed by a friend of mine, and I would love to hear your observations on it. He said, look, Chuck, every depiction of Jesus Christ, it makes it quite clear that his image is dark skinned, long hair, beard. Do you think he would have any chance to vote anywhere south of the Mason-Dixon line oh before 1968 and the Civil Rights Act? We're gonna keep Jesus from voting? <laughs> <laughs> if he were out there now, he would have a problem. Especially with the woolly, woolly hair. <laughs> he probably wouldn't be able to get into some of our churches either. <laughs> so exactly. now, being, being an equal opportunity offender, I will venture that the four of us know full well exactly how he would vote in the 1920 election. <laughs> we'd put we'd put good Vegas money on that one. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting though that uh, in this era we're still talking about ways in which to you know on the one hand increase increase voting access and to limit it at the same time. It's just kind of watching this, this dichotomy of, 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 of actions is, is just kind of fascinating, you know, on the one hand, seeing the push, seeing the kinds of things that 
folks like Stacey Abrams have done to really increase voter registration. So you've got that on one hand, you've got other states doing all kinds of things to make certain that it's easier to register to vote, like even tying it to renewing your driver's license and, and making it so that when you come out of, uh, if you're incarcerated, when you come out, you know, you get your bus card, you get a voter registration card, uh, ways to, I mean, those kinds of things are taking place at the same time that we're hearing about these ridiculous notions of, you know, the kinds of things that are taking place, like, you know, cutting out weekends to register, which is absurd because that's, that's just absurd on its face. I don't even have to describe it, but, you know, you're seeing this, this dichotomy of ways in which we're addressing the question of voting, uh, increasing it on the one hand, restricting as much as we can by others. And it's, it's, it's going to be kind of even more fascinating to watch when we get ready for, you know, the midterm elections in 2022. I think that's probably even going to be more fascinating than what we just went through because what we're now looking about is, is looking at the soul of what it means to be a Republican. You've got, you know, they've got to step up and say, who are we? And it's, I'm just fascinated to kind of watch and see who they decide they want to become. Yeah, I don't often hear those two nouns in the same sentence, soul and Republican, but, you know, be my guess. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, but, you know. So, oh, question. Underneath all of this, as is manifestly obvious, this is an assertion by an entire political party of intentional inequality that is based on a constitutionally legally prohibited category. It's illegal to do that stuff, but they do it. What the heck is going on? You know, on my case, go ahead, I'm sorry, Rebecca. That's okay, Bill, thank you. Um, one of the commentators um, on CNN was making a statement that, um, and I had to agree, that the party, the Republican party basically at this point has decided if we can't win with the rules that exist, then we'll have to change the rules. And no matter how ridiculous uh, the assertions are to support uh, trying to bring about that change, they're willing to do it because they, they want to preserve um, whatever it is they think uh, is embedded in their principles. So is the current principle, as my friend alleges, if you can't beat them, cheat them? Is that... Uh, I think it is. And, and um, I think that your earlier question really <laughs> speaks to that. And that is this, is that there is a great fear uh, in this country with regard to a, a large portion of the white population. Uh, they're seeing America not being white America anymore. It, uh, the population, um, the, the, the ways of intermarrying and um, the shift from at one point in time, a white America to a, um, you know, America that is made up of people of color, and that's the, the biggest part, portion of the population, that's what, where we're going, that drives a fear in people. And uh, people who, um, uh, you know, uh, homogenous America, and um, obviously want to think back to the time in which uh, the ruling party was uh, white America, uh, that strikes fear in them, and they will do anything they can to stop that uh, trend from, from going, or at least if it's going to go that way, that they're going to have the power base to make the decisions in this country. And that's really what, what I think is really driving this is just fear. Yeah, but some people forget that back in um, the snook before I was born or around the time that I was born, um, that some of the values of the Republican Party was, you know, some of the values were more like the democratic values now. Um, so, you know, the platforms have shifted and flipped a little bit. And, um, and, and I know that people assume that all black people are Democrats, but that's not true. That's obviously not true. Um, and, and I will say that in my lifetime, I have voted um, purple. So, you know, blue or red. And my, my dad was born in 1918. If he was living, he'd be 103 this year. And he was a Republican. And people are surprised to hear that. Um, but the values were, you know, flip-flopped a little bit uh, back when he was voting and, and um, the Republican associations 
um, that he had the affiliate affiliations that he had were were very very um, good to you know good for him good to yeah. him. Oh yeah, yeah. That that generation that you speak of with your dad, um, you know, comes out of the the party of Lincoln, the Republican being the Republican Party being the party of Lincoln historically, and of course that shift occurred as you know in the nineteen was it the 1960s with the uh, Southern strategy, I guess, with uh, uh, with Nixon and uh, who was the other guy? Uh, can't remember. Where the parties basically kind of switched. And of course, now what we, I, 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 for the life of me now, can't figure out what the party principles are going to be other than to suppress the vote of anyone who is is of color. I mean, I, I I'm having a real difficult time trying to trying to sort that and and and, and figure out who in fact are actual who are the Republicans. When we talk about the Republican Party, who is it? I mean, you have all these people that are leaving. You know, people that we know of that have disavowed. You know, the principle, the so whatever is taking place. I mean, even people like. I was reading an article the other day. I found myself in agreement with George Will. It was just, just a frightening thing. <laughs> you know? We were on the same page. I was like, oh boy, what have we? Where, where are we going here? So um, that's the thing I'm kind of looking. So when people talk about this, the Republican Party, who exactly are we talking about? Is it the George Wills or the David Brooks or the? you know, Peggy Newlands or even the Liz Cheney's, or are we just talking about people who support Donald Trump? I, I, I'm, I'm, I have difficulty trying to sort that out. Not difficulty, because I don't spend time on it, but it is something to think about in terms of what that means going forward, because I'd like to think, I, I, I'd like to think that that, that that demographic, which Bill referred to, you know, these are just, you know, it, it, it's shrinking. I like to think that that demographic is shrinking and not prepared to really move forward with what, I mean, they have these ideas, but I don't think it's something that can actually take place. I'm not sure. I don't know how you guys think about that. I, I, yeah. Well, I think that the Republican Party is struggling the same way you're struggling as to who we are. Um, they're having a difficult time regrouping and they have it, having a difficult time standing um, and with a straight face and, and saying that supported um, the past president, okay? Especially after what happened um, on January 6th. So, yeah. you know, yeah. I think that that question is being asked within the party uh, and you're seeing purges of people uh, within the party um, who don't, and at least the party itself believe, don't really uh, espouse the same ideals that the party should be espousing. So um, I'm like you, I'd like to see where are the, Republican Party is going to go, and and, and who are really uh, Republicans uh, uh, in this day and age? So one of the questions that arises then is exactly that very very divided, very oppositional split within the party. On the one hand, Trump has controlled the money and the donors and still does to a great extent, at a level that people like McConnell and Graham and others still kowtow to him. McConnell, for example, leaked a very careful worded quote before the impeachment trial that Trump committed impeachable offenses. He voted not to convict Trump based on a claim that it wasn't constitutional to impeach somebody who was no longer president, a claim that had been considered and rejected 55-45 by the Senate, which if it were in a lawsuit would constitute law of the case and would bind them. They couldn't exactly. use that exactly. defense yeah. exactly. to, to vote not to convict him. But because there were no such rules in the Senate proceeding, they could do that. They could violate their own body's ruling that you can't rely on that defense. That's not a legal defense. And then he turned around after that vote and said, not through an aid, personally, in front of all the cameras, 
This guy's guilty of sin. So hey, if they don't know who they are, how the heck are people who are supposed to support them know who they are? Put yeah. it in somebody else's lap. <laughs> he says, I want to put this out there. Hint, hint. <laughs> Hey, well, I, so I my, think his, his poll numbers have dropped uh, rather significantly yeah. in the home state. And that's, at least in terms of the people who previously supported him. And, and two, third, two thirds of Americans support the $1.9 billion COVID relief yeah, plan. Yeah, and you got that as well. So, yeah. So, so these looking. people are not supporting, they're not representing their constituents. In fact, if you look at the impeachment conviction vote, 5743, the number of people represented by the senators who voted in favor of impeachment it is far more than 57% of right. the electorate. It's, it's right. a huge proportion of the electorate. The 43 represent only a very small portion of the voters, of the people. That's a good point. I haven't right. thought of it that way, but you're absolutely right. right. So my friend, the quipster, asks, he said, so Chuck, am I wrong? There's only two things I don't like about Mitch McConnell, and that's his face. <laughs> I can't disagree with him, <laughs> but but it's a serious question for people. I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin. Like Rebecca, my dad was born in 1918. He was a decorated World War II veteran. He was a doctor. He was head of cardiovascular research at the University of Wisconsin Hospitals. He was state surgeon for the state of Wisconsin. He was a lieutenant colonel in the National Guard. He was a pretty decorated guy. Only Christmas trees in Wisconsin were probably more decorated than he was. But he was a Republican in a way and at a time that my mother, who was considerably on the other end of the spectrum, could live with because he voted his conscience, he believed his conscience, and the Republicans that we had at that time 1950s, 1960s in Wisconsin, were pretty responsible people. Um, and they were responsible to the electric. Since then, Ryan, Walker, Johnson, uh -huh, uh -huh. Ooh, I am glad not to uh, have any voting responsibility for any of those people. Yeah. You know, my, my mother, who's Japanese and who's passed away, bless her soul, um, was Republican. And she was a Republican because my stepdad was a Republican. But their views of being Republicans was because they believed that the government was too much in their business. The government uh, should not be taxing them at that level since they had worked hard for their money. So their ideas were basically the conservative ideas that are, are based on what America was really all about. Um, you know, hard work gets you to a point in life and you know, you should be taken care of and the government should stay out of your life, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and both of them have passed at this point, but I don't see them, had they been alive, supporting our past president. Because just because a Republican doesn't necessarily mean that they have the same types of um, beliefs um, with regard to the things that he believed in. Uh -huh. And um, I think that I would have had a very, very interesting conversation with them because I think at that point, they would have probably told me they would have crossed lines to vote at uh -huh. that point. Um, and I think that a lot of America is like that. And there's a good portion yeah. of Republicans are like that as well. And I think the danger with a lot of politicians, and this is a danger with all politicians, I think, is they have to, they try to please everyone. And I think McConnell is speaking out of both sides of his mouth to please yeah. everyone, okay? Because he's worried about being reelected. Uh, and um, I think that's a real problem with our politicians generally is that we have to take a stand. If you're not going to get reelected because you did the right thing, then you did the right thing. OK. Um, and if you're going to be reelected because you did the right thing, then you did the right thing. OK. So um, don't squirt 
and 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 try to try to walk in the middle of the street there, but you're not going to be able to. Um, I don't think I could be able to live with myself. And I don't think that's why. I think that's why I'm not a politician because I would take a stand. Um, and um, in doing that, I would not be able to raise money enough to become a politician yeah. and, and to be elected. But additionally, if I was, uh, I'd be a one-term politician because I'd take a position that probably um, would rankle some people on one side or the other. And I think that's that's really the problem with people like McConnell. Um, they're worried about their position versus what they're supposed to be worried about. And that is that their constituents and who they actually represent you know, across the board. So as we come into our last couple of minutes here, let me ask you folks a question for your Republican parents and our friends who you feel would not be able to support the most recent president. Is that because of the kind of person he was, because of his politics, or both? Well, for my parents, I think it would be because of the person he was, because of how you know uh, divisive he was, um, you know how um, he didn't care about the common person. Um, you know, my parents are very much caring parents. Uh, they just happen to be Republicans who cared about people. And throughout history, obviously, there were Republicans who cared about people. Exactly. You know, yeah, it's lots of them. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Starting with Abe, Abe Lincoln, you know. Oh, um, and you so, we, we, Eisenhower. And Eisenhower. I mean, you these were, Repub there were Republicans you could have these conversations with, understanding that there is a level, there is a basis of a personal integrity um, that attaches to, that attached to all of them, such that you are looking at, for the most part, fairly principled people. We may disagree on you know, some things, but that does not make us enemies per se. It just shows that we have different perspectives and we can sit down and have dinner and we'll be okay. Um, That's exactly right. Decency and humanity has to has to, to be considered at some point. I mean, there are just some things that a person, um, you know, shouldn't do if they're, if they're a decent human being. And uh, we saw kids in cages uh, in that uh, last administration. Yeah. I mean, that should have that should have been the thing that, that you know, the straw that, that broke the camel's back for some people. And, um, and I think yeah. for some it was. And I think for some it, I, it actually was. I um, agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, to this day, there, the, in Charlottesville, I still shudder when I think about those folks who are walking through carrying those torches, you know, sh shouting, the Jews, that just jarred me to the point where, you know, we do cookouts a lot. We did it at our house, and I get those torches to light the yard up. You know, I can't buy those things anymore. My conscience won't let me do that. So, I mean, a, a little thing like that is it became such a symbol to me, a frightening symbol mm -hmm. that, I mean, it sounds kind of silly, but I can't buy a tiki torch anymore. I understand but, that. Yeah. No, so. completely. And my, my parents would too. They actually saw that burning crosses in the yards. So we're out of time for today. I want to thank you all, uh, Ms. Mediator and non-lawyer Rebecca, and <laughs> Mr. Lawyer Bill Harrison, and Ms. Judge, Ms. Sims, and a reformed lawyer, me. I haven't litigated for seven years. <laughs> so that's, that's my abstinence. Be <laughs> Take care. Come back and see us in two weeks. And be well, be safe, be healthy. Yes, thank you. Look forward to Great it. Great talk Look as forward. always. Thank you.